There are many different ways to install Drupal on a web server. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to install Drupal using FTP. The FTP method requires the least technical know-how, thus it's a good place to start if you're new to working with web servers. But if you're comfortable working with servers from a command line, you might want to skip to the next tutorial, installing Drupal with SSH and Drush. That is the method the experts like to use. It saves you several steps, but if you're unfamiliar with Linux commands, it might be a little daunting. There are a few prerequisites we need to go over before we can start our install. First, I'm going to assume you have access to web hosting that meets Drupal's requirements. In addition, we'll need to be able to create databases and have FTP or SFTP access to the server. The easiest way to get the proper hosting set up is to get an account with a commercial web host provider. For more information on the types of hosting available, see the tutorial, Installation Requirements and Options. If you're not ready to commit to a commercial host, but still want to work through this tutorial, I recommend getting a trial account with WebEnabled at webenabled.com. WebEnabled will give you full FTP access to your trial account, so you can follow along with the steps in this tutorial. You'll also need an FTP client. Here I recommend FileZilla. It's free and works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and really is a pretty good FTP client. You can download and install it for free at FileZilla-project.org, or get the portable version in the Webmaster Tools Kit. For more information about this, see the tutorial, Essentials Webmaster Tools. The first step in our installation is to set up a database for Drupal to store its data. Various web hosts will provide different ways of accomplishing this. The easiest way is to use a database manager such as phpMyAdmin or any of the alternatives provided by hosting control panels. Advanced users might want to use the command line, or if all else fails, you might just want to ask your host to set it up for you. In this tutorial, we're going to look at the database manager method. In the tutorial, installing Drupal using SSH and Drush will show you how to use the command line method. Let's take a look at how to create a database on a real web server. Here I've opened a very popular database manager called phpMyAdmin. This one's running on a web-enabled account, but many hosts provide this as a part of their hosting packages. It makes creating a database incredibly easy. We simply go to this field and type in the name of the database we want. There, we've created our tutorial database. Now there's nothing actually in this database yet. We can tell that because this number here represents the number of tables. There's zero, so there's no data in it. That's going to be up to Drupal's installer to put the data in, but we have to give the installer a database to work with. Let's take a look at another fairly popular way of creating database tables. This is something called a control panel. This one in particular is called cPanel, but there are several others out there like it. They're pretty popular with shared hosting providers as they allow users to manage their own websites. They give us all these different tools, so I'm going to scroll down to the MySQL tools. We have this MySQL database wizard. I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and here I take the name of my database. Now it's going to ask me for one more step, and that's to create a user. What actually happens with databases is you have to create a database and a user. We didn't with our web-enabled account because it came with one for free. A lot of ones do that, but here we are going to have to create one. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in admin and a password. And create my user. I say what privileges I want to give that user to work with this database. I want to give it all privileges. And now I'm done. I can return home and go to this controller and we see that I have a database and I have a user to work with it. The next step is we need to upload Drupal's files to our server. The first thing we need to do is to download them from Drupal.org. Once on the site, we click to download and extend, download Drupal 7, and we want to select from these two archives. If you're on a Windows machine, I recommend using the zip. If you're on a Mac or a Linux machine, use the tarball. So I'm going to go ahead and download the zip file here. I click Save and let it start downloading. Now that our archive is finished downloading, I want to uncompress the files and save them to my desktop. So I'll just double click on this, close out a couple windows here, and drag this to my desktop so it uncompresses. And this will take a few moments. Now I want to upload these files to our web server. To do that, I'm going to use our FTP client. I'll go ahead and launch it. And the first thing I want to do is I want to log in to our server. So I'm going to go ahead and log in to Acme Example. 
And so now we see the file structure on our web server over in this window. I need to navigate to where the web files are going to go. This is actually a level below that where there's all kinds of administrative files. On most servers, what you're looking for is something that's labeled public HTML or www. Both are actually alias the same place, so I'll just click into here. And now I can simply drag and drop these files in as I need to. And now it's starting to do our file upload. Now that our files have finished uploading, let's run back to our browser and let's see what our website looks like. So I'm going to run back to our main domain name. And we see that we now have the Drupal installer. We've just got to run through these last few steps to get our site up and running. I've talked a little bit about what the next few pages of settings are in a previous video, installing Drupal on a personal computer. So we're just going to accept the standard default and click Save and Continue. We want to install in English, and again, we're going to click Save and Continue. Now suddenly this time, we get an error page. And it says that we have some problems with some files um, and some directories. So I'll show you a little trick about what's going on here. You won't always get these errors on every host. It's going to depend on how your host is set up. But I'll show you how we can fix this problem. I'm going to run back to my FTP program, and we need to click into Sites slash Default to see where the issue is. There's two things we need to do here. One is I want to create a new directory called Files. Basically, Drupal needs a place to store its user files. These are files that are uploaded by people who are doing content management um, and things along those lines, basically people uploading through the browser. And so we need to create that directory. The other thing is it needs a writable file to store the database information. That's what this file is, but it wants to rename it. So here's what I'm going to do real quick. I'm going, to dr I'm going to drag this back over here. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to Settings, and that's the one it's going to actually work with, but it also wants this file. So I need to have all these three sitting in here. And then the last thing I need to do is I need to set the file permissions for these two, uh, for this directory and for this file, so that Drupal can write to them. So I'll check this, I'll select this, and go to File Permissions and I'm going to go to 777. Basically that means that the web server now can read and write and execute on these files. So I run back to my browser, click refresh, and our problems are all gone. Now we see a new page that we didn't see in our previous local installation. That's because now Drupal needs to, needs to connect to the database. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my database credentials here. Acme exam and Tutorial is the name that we gave our database. And I need to put in the username and password. And my password. I'm going to click Save and Continue. Now Drupal's writing all the files into the database. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So we go back to our control panel, and we scroll down to PHP My Admin, and now we can click into our database. And we see that we have all these tables in here, many of them populated with some data, and so the Drupal uh, installer did that for us. So we run back to our website, and we notice that we have this warning that it wants us to change our permissions back on our settings file. This is really a security issue, so I can just run back to my FTP, click File Permissions, and I'm going to change this back to 644. Close that, and now I can complete my installation. I'm going to go ahead and leave this site name for now. We can change that later using Drupal's admin. In fact, all of these settings on this page we can change using the admin, but let's go ahead and put in some defaults to start out. Now I am going to put in the email address, and we talked about this before, but this is a very important email address because this is what Drupal sends its notifications to. So I'm going to go ahead and put in an example email address. I'd recommend on your site you want to use something that you can actually receive emails from. I'm going to put in a username of admin, and I'm going to put in a password. On our local machine, I put in a password of admin, um, and that was a very low security password, but because this is a live web server, um, I actually want to put in something that has some security to it. And my passwords match. I select what country I'm from, 
And of course, the last thing, we talked about this in a previous video, but these notifications here will automatically let you know whenever you need to do updates to your website, particularly whenever it develops security vulnerabilities. So I'm gonna leave those checked. We click Save and Continue. And now we've got a live Drupal website up and running. I click through, and here's our new Drupal website. The FTP process for installing Drupal does have several steps, but I really don't think that they're too bad. In my experience, I found that 90% of the problems people have are server configuration issues, mostly caused because different hosts have different server setups. Once you've done it a few times, I think you'll find that it becomes second nature. 